Thank you so much for agreeing to the interview, uh, Archbishop Justin. The, uh, we're going to be talking about Thy Kingdom Come, which is a fantastic initiative, uh, a unity prayer movement really, across the UK and now across the world. But we are recording this in the early part of January, so my first question was going to be, are you a New Year's resolution sort of person? Do you have any New Year's resolutions? Yes, I had one. You had one. I had one, which is never to make New Year's <laughs> resolutions, and I've ah, kept it. That old chestnut. Well, okay, fair enough. Um, but something that is fairly new in the time that you've been uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is Thy Kingdom Come. I think it started a couple of years ago, didn't it? I think, is this the third year or the fourth year? I can't remember. You've described it as, uh, you said, I cannot remember in my life anything that I've been involved in where I have sensed so clearly the work of the Spirit. Why is that? Well, of course, it's tempting to answer by saying, uh, because I can't remember anything <laughs> in my life where I've sensed so clearly the work of the Spirit. But why have I sensed the work of the Spirit? I think because it's quite unusual, I mean, very unusual, for something like this just to seem to gather Christians together on such a global basis. I think this year it'll be in well over 100 countries. And there's the great blessing is it's no longer an Anglican thing. Nothing, certainly no longer an archbishop's thing. I mean, mm. Arch the Archbishop of York and I sort of launched it together, Archbishop Sentamu. But it's gone way beyond that. And it feels as though we hoisted a rather small sail, rather nervously, and there was a howling gale of the spirit which seemed to carry us and carry this whole thing forward in the most beautiful way. And it is very much about gathering Christians for prayer. I mean, that's been happening yeah. for millennia. But what... Two, what is, to be precise. Yes, two of them, to be precise. What, what, has, what have you seen, though? What's different about this particular gathering of Christians for prayer? I don't think it's unique. I think it's biblical. Mm because it started with looking at what the disciples did between Ascension and the Ascension of Jesus and Pentecost. So they returned to the city, this is Acts 1, Acts, Acts 1 stuff. They returned to the city and prayed. And uh, the Spirit came. And so it's just basically biblical. I think what we've tried to do is first of all depersonalize it so it really isn't there's no figurehead mm. um it's not called the archbishop's initiative in thy kingdom come it's just thy kingdom come it picks up on a phrase in a well-known prayer the best known prayer it and it's not that directive it says pray for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. But how you pray is up to you. Mm. So it gives space for people all around the world in different cultures, different contexts, different church traditions, simply say, okay, we'll do it this way. Mm. And that's fine. And what are some of the stories you've seen? What surprised you when you put your sail up and suddenly the wind started blowing? Well, the thing that surprised me most initially was the number of people who got involved. Mm. I remember the first year, uh, we went to a cathedral and then, you know, that was wonderful that the cathedrals said, yeah, we want to do this. And they found that they were packed out. And that first year, going to different cathedrals and just finding full cathedrals, that was rather mm. amazing. You thought something's happening here. And then the second year, this growing momentum and of people really eager to pray. And you know, it's a real, all of us know that prayer isn't always the easiest thing, but it seems to have just released in people a sense of, this is good, this is what God wants, this is what I like. Mm. I understand that this year, a number of national church leaders as well are, are very much getting behind like Indeed. Income. Churches together in England, the presidents of churches together in England, which is the heads of the different mm -hmm. churches, uh, are, are really, really supportive. 
and uh, the Methodists have been particularly supportive, and the Catholics, and uh, the Orthodox, and their Pentecostals, they're all piling mm. in. So it, again, it's not an Anglican thing, it's just a Christian thing. It's followers of Jesus wanting to pray that more people become followers of Jesus. And we've seen some extraordinary stories of people coming to faith in Christ. Uh, we hear them from all around the country of, uh, you know, the thing is you're asked to pray for five. Right. And uh, praying for five, that's great. Pray every day that they come to know Jesus. And uh, you commit to doing that during the Thy Kingdom Come 10 days. And it's, um, we just keep hearing people saying, I can't believe it, I'm so surprised. I started praying for five and two of them, three of them have become Christians. Wow. You know, and I just, huh. <laughs> Whoa. Who knew? <laughs> Prayer works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's remarkable, isn't it? Well, that's one of my pre great predecessors within yeah. Temple who said, said, the strange thing is when I pray, there seem to be a lot of coincidences. <laughs> and when I don't, there aren't. Oh, and then, when I don't, yeah. there aren't. Um, it, it is a unity movement. It's about praying for, obviously, God's kingdom to come on earth. And you've been passionate about evangelism in your time as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Obviously, the statistics that come around every year or so still tell us churches are in decline, Christianity in decline, more people saying they're not religious. Do you see this movement in any way as changing that kind of landscape? What I see this movement as, and it's got no deeper rationale than the command of Jesus, which seems to me to be quite an adequate reason for doing it. Jesus said to his disciples, go back into the city and pray for the Spirit. So we're praying for the Spirit to come because it's the Spirit of God who brings people to faith in Christ, not human beings. Mm. Human beings are part of it. They have to communicate. But actually it's the Spirit. And, you know, Wesley's great phrase when he said, I was, my heart was strangely warmed. Mm. That was the Spirit. And... We, TKC is about obedience to the scriptures and obedience to Jesus Christ. Um, the result is God's problem. Right. Do, do you feel, in that sense, whatever happens, optimistic, uh, regardless of what the, I suppose, statistics may or may not tell us on a, on a long basis? I'm never basis. optimistic. <laughs> I'm always hopeful. Okay. And I am what, hope filled. What is the difference between being optimistic and Oh, and hope optimism is, is, is a part of your personality or not. I'm an E or not a Tigger. <laughs> um, optimism is human created, you know. Hope rests on the faithfulness of God in Christ. And that's what we hold on to as Christians. We're not optimists. We might be optimists, we might be pessimists, but we are all mm. hope filled because that's about Jesus. Obviously, the, the movement is about the Spirit. It's obviously tied into Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit. In your own life, um, I think it's fair to say you, you've come from a reasonably charismatic background. Do, do you, what do you, how do you see that expressed in your own prayer life? Is that something where oh. you, you see the... I love the phrase, a reasonably. That's a really... <laughs> are you an Anglican? I'm not, no. Well, you sound like one well, when you say it reasonably maybe, charismatic. Maybe I'm, that, I'm that's, close that's, enough. I really like that. I'm United Reformed Church, so maybe that's close oh, enough. Oh yeah, that'll but... do. That'll do. <laughs> reasonably, char reasonably charismatic as opposed to unreasonably <laughs> charismatic. I just think that's great. Uh, well, in, uh, I hope, uh, in my own prayer life, well, I mean, the obvious, I mean, the obvious thing is, is part of my daily prayer discipline is praying in tongues every day for a certain period. Mm. Um, and not as a sort of occasional thing, but as just part of daily prayer. Part of my daily prayer discipline is expecting to hear from God um, through people with words, knowledge or prophecies, and an awful lot of those come in, and some, some of them are, shall we say, we, I read them and think, mm, I'm not entirely sure about that, and others, you think, oh, yes, I can sense something of mm. the Spirit of God in that. Mm. But these are, I think the danger with putting charismatic as a sort of 
tribal category within the church is first of all, all Christians are filled with the Spirit. Mm. Paul is perfectly clear that, about that uh, in Romans. Secondly, um, so everyone is a charismatic. Every Christian is a charismatic in one sense. Secondly, some of the things that historically charismatics are, you know, we do healing. Yeah, the church has always done healing. Mm. Uh, the charismatic and non-charismatic bits pray for healing, mm. anoint for healing, lay hands for healing. Um, so I'm cautious about turning it into a tribal thing. Absolutely. I mean, I can imagine though, I mean, many Christians will have exactly the same experience and it'd be unremarkable speaking in tongues. Yeah, the, 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 I would say that for me. I mean, it's very seldom ecstatic. It is, but you can imagine some people who aren't familiar with that being, gosh, does the Archbishop of Canterbury pray in tongues? Um, but for you, it's, it's obviously not an issue. It's not, not something to... No, it's, yeah. it's not something to make a great song and dance about. Um, and um, given it's usually extremely early in the morning, <laughs> um, it's not usually an immensely ecstatic moment because I'm sort of uh, <laughs> struggling. <laughs> I did see some figures um, suggesting, I don't know how reliable they are, that perhaps atheism is in decline in the UK now, perhaps church going is. Do, I mean, do you, do you pray in that sense for the church to be revived numerically? No, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I pray for people to come to faith in Jesus mm. Christ. Not as a survival thing for the church. Um, God's church is not threatened. There is no threat to God's church because it's God's church. Mm. And Jesus promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we don't need to worry about the future of the church. And we don't need to get all agitated about particular church institutions. We need to be concerned about living in obedience to Jesus Christ. So I pray for people to come to Christ because that's what the Bible tells me to do. And that's what Jesus tells me to do. And that'll do for me. I'm sure you also do a lot of praying for this nation as well. Um, yes. And in a sense, th that unity movement that is thy kingdom come is coming at a time when, you know, it feels like we're in a bit of a almost semi-permanent crisis with Brexit and so on, uh, in, in our view. You only spoke just recently actually in the House of Lords. Yes, uh, About that. Um, and <laughs> I think it's, it's in, I think you, you described it as a, it would be a political, practical and moral failure if we left with, a no, with no deal. Uh, do you feel like the politicians have let us down at some level so far? No, uh, I think they have the most extraordinarily difficult job. And actually, I didn't say that. OK. So it's really important to get what I did say, mm. because that would be a party political statement. Right. What I said was that... Um, it is really that the burden of proof is on those who are arguing for no deal to show that it will not harm the poorest and the most vulnerable. Mm. And I went on to say that may be true. So yeah. if that's clear, yeah. that's fine. But what I'm, the, the burden of the speech was not about whether we should have a no deal or no no deal or the withdrawal agreement as it's set out, which I'm one of the few geeky people who's read, <laughs> and the political declaration, all 585 pages of the former. Um, but it's, the question is about the poor and the vulnerable, because they are close to the heart of God in Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew 25. And so how we care about them and how our politics affects them is a deeply moral issue. Have politicians let us down? No. Politicians have one of the hardest jobs in the world mm. and we need to pray for them. It is unbelievably difficult. And possibly the one with the hardest job is Theresa May. What, what would your prayer for her be if, uh, if, you, you know, if you were to pray for her? Well, when I pray for politicians and for her and other politicians, which I do every day, with genuine affection and respect, they are our elected leaders. We need to respect them. I pray for all our political leaders of any party in the same way, for wisdom, for courage, and for strength for them and their families, and for them internally, their psychology, their, their sense of well-being. I pray that they'll be blessed, mm. each of them, because they are precious people in the sight of God 
who we entrust with more responsibility than any of us could cope with. Mm. And I sp I'm sure in the role you inhabit, where you're uh, presiding over a very diverse church and with all the tensions and political issues that that involves, you have some sympathy for those who, in the political sphere, <laughs> sort of it's probably right. have, have a similar role to play. Yeah, I think they have a harder role than I do. But I, I, yes, the little taste of it that I get from yeah. time to time increases my sympathy for yes. them, but not on a party basis, right across the range. You're, you're active on Twitter, um, and uh, one of the things I noticed you tweeting about back in the summer was when you were due to speak at the TUC conference. And, Indeed. And that raised all of those questions, as you would expect, and as, as you fully anticipated about to what extent should the Archbishop of Canterbury be speaking on political stages and so on. Is, I mean, you've said before as well, Jesus was highly political, though yes. he was not party political. Exactly. So, so would Jesus speak, I suppose, at the TUC in your well, opinion? Well, I was reading Luke 19 the other day, where Jesus, with Zacchaeus, and Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down, and then they have that ex wonderful exchange, the restoration of Zacchaeus. And then they go off and have a meal together. Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' his house. Zacchaeus was a traitor, a crook, tax collector, uh, a really bad guy. And the people round were saying, what's he doing going there? The gospel goes everywhere. Let us not put up walls against the gospel. Where should the gospel not be preached? Give me a list. I can't give you any well, examples. I can't either. Though. And I started off my speech to the TUC by saying, I warn you, there's going to be a lot of God in this. <laughs> but if you ask the Archbishop of Canterbury, what do you expect? And then I spoke from, my text was the Magnificat. Mm. And uh, also something from Amos and some other passages. If someone asks me to, if someone gives me a chance to speak about mm. Jesus Christ mm. to people who may not know who he is, I will take it. But if, if that opportunity means you feel compelled to speak a, about the current way the welfare system is being enacted yeah. and that sort of thing, for you that, that doesn't cross that line as it were to well, be It depends how it. you do it. Um, we are called as Christians to speak, I mean, by the Bible. Mm. I, you see, the moment you start taking a secular political analysis, a human one, you know, left, right wing, left wing, right wing, Marxism versus Milton Friedman or Hayek, political scientists or economists, when you impose that on the Bible, you get nonsense. Mm because it is incapable mm. of measuring the Bible. The Bible is not left wing or right wing, it is God's wing. <laughs> and we need to preach the scriptures. And in the scriptures, we find Mary declaring that God will put down the powerful from their seats and raise up the humble and weak, mm. that God will send the rich away empty and feed the poor and the hungry we find in the, in the prophets an absolute determination that a just society represents the nature of God. Mm. So of course there's politics, but it's not left wing or right wing. It's seeking to be obedient to God. And I'm sure I get that wrong quite regularly, but that's the yeah. problem with being human. Um, which leads us into the sort of the way that you carry out your role as Archbishop of Canterbury, um, the, the person who, in a sense, uh, has some spiritual authority within the Church of England. Um, <laughs> some. some. Well, I was going to ask. <laughs> in did, a sense. Did, how much real... I like in a sense and some. Let's stick with in a sense and some. I really enjoy that. Do, do, I mean, do you feel like you have, a, in that sense, any real control or power in, in the position you inhabit? Control? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Take back control. <laughs> you coined no. that phrase, yeah. Um, yeah, there is power. I've had to recognize that mm. reluctantly. I'm unhappy with that, but it's the reality. 
But it's not power in the sense that I can say jump and people say how high. It's power, I'm sort of thinking aloud here because I haven't really worked this question out. There is power in the sense of being able to put things on agendas. I don't mean literally, mm. well there is in meetings, but I mean bring subjects to the front. Take TKC. The Archbishop of York and I, in one sense, essentially exercised power. But it wasn't power that meant that everyone would automatically say, yes, sir, we are now going to pray between Ascension and Pentecost because the Archbishop said so. It's power to get that into the public eye. And by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit, people said, actually, unusually on this occasion, we think they're probably right. It would be a good thing to do this. Mm. So it's a very different sort of power. Absolutely. And, and it is, um, you are, what's the Latin phrase, primus inter pares, um, first among equals, is it? The, in Technically. In terms of the, your, your, yes. the, the rest of the Anglican community. That's what and, they say. And, and the bishops. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we're looking ahead, you know, uh, 2020 will be the Lambeth Conference. Um, we've yes. We've got all of those issues in the pipeline, I'm sure you're, yes. you're fully aware. Um, it's a complete surprise. <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing that so often comes around, obviously, in the news agenda are issues around sexuality and those sorts of issues. And these are the big issues that, that I'm sure are, are going to be on the agenda uh, in a couple of years' time. Um, for the more ordinary Christian, I think a lot of ordinary Christians are left wondering, I don't know what I think about this. There are strong opinions on both sides on gay marriage, sexuality and that sort of thing. What, I mean, what's your advice for, in that sense, the, the person who, who doesn't have it figured out? Well, I could wrap it on for ages about that, but I'll get it down to three bits of advice. Mm. One, read the Bible carefully. Not just the bits that you agree with, but read it carefully and seek God's wisdom. See how Jesus treated those who thought themselves holy and those who thought themselves sinners. Secondly, pray a lot, particularly for those you disagree with. Mm -hmm. Not that they may be blasted or that they may be you know, removed from the church or whatever, but that they may be blessed. Pray for them, for the grace of God to fill them because they're your sisters and brothers in Christ. They're family. And thirdly, love one another. That's not a phrase I coined. <laughs> love one another. Jesus said to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. And he didn't, you know, Judas was one of them. He washed Judas' feet. So those are the three things I'd say pastorally, and the three things I try, not always successfully, to do, and I fail to do it. Mm. Is there a simple answer? If there's a simple answer, we'd have found it. Yeah. And it's a complex of things, and every church not just the Anglicans. Every church is struggling and has always struggled between the balance of what holiness looks like and how we treat those who fall short. Do we condemn them and expel them? Or do we only let them go on the church under certain conditions? Do we ignore it and say it really doesn't matter? Mm. Of course not. But the difference between setting the ideal and applying that ideal pastorally has always been a tension for the church. And these issues are hugely, hugely, hugely important. Because it's real people. It's real people whose lives are deeply impacted. And whoever it is, whatever view they take, you know, conservative or liberal, revisionist or orthodox traditionalist part of it and I struggle with this I'm not pretending I find it easy we have to hear what they're saying trouble is you sometimes people don't feel that they've been heard unless they've also been agreed with which mm. is a bit more complicated <laughs> I mean just to add another complex issue into the mix there oh, was this <laughs> recent advice from bishops about the use of baptismal liturgy 
possibly as a way of um, uh, marking a gender transition. That caused, yeah. obviously, again, headlines and controversy. I mean, what, what was that, what's actually going on there? Because I, I sometimes what's going feel, on feel was, we get to... Oh, right. yeah. it's, it's very straightforward. What's going on is the, there was a general synod resolution which said to the bishops, has the bishops who are responsible for doctrine in the church, I mean, as bishops are, uh, it's not just an Anglican thing, that goes back to the beginning of the church's history. Um, please provide a liturgy for people who've gone through uh, transition mm. as trans transgender people. And the bishops looked at that, sent it off to what we call the liturgical commission. They looked at it and came back and said, we don't need one. Mm. Don't need a special liturgy. What we need, what, we'll give some guidance. It's not binding, people can take it or leave it. This is not an instruction, right. and there is no change of doctrine. I see. It is simply saying, if you want to use the structure of the baptismal liturgy to mark a transition in someone's life, not as a new baptism, let's be clear, because you're only baptized once, but not as a new baptism, but as a, a way of people saying, affirming their identity in Christ. In the same way as if someone who's been baptized finds faith in Christ in a new way, mm. sometimes they will have an affirmation of their baptismal, reaffirmation of their baptismal vows, which you know, will look quite like a baptism, will say the baptism promises, but as a way of saying, this is who I am. Mm. And um, it's guidance, it's not a rule. People are free to ignore it, and it's not a change in doctrine in any way at all. Obviously, any time these things come up, it does, you know, there's yeah. many different views. And how difficult is it for you, and what do you do when you're in the midst of those competing views, to, to hold together this extraordinary complex and diverse institution that is the, uh, the Anglican Church? Or is that not your job? <laughs> it's a really interesting question, I think, that. Is it difficult? Yes. Does it keep me awake at night? Yes. Should it? I'm not sure. I think increasingly I'm thinking my job, I mean, I start as a Christian with believing that scripture properly interpreted is the final authority for matters of faith and matters of practice. Mm. Scripture properly interpreted. The trouble is, as we all know, that through the centuries, Scripture has often been misinterpreted, misused, abused. And that's one of the reasons in the Church of England we're doing an enormous project with four working streams called Living in Love and Faith. Started off looking at uh, human sexuality. Uh, it'll be a two-year, more than two-year project. Uh, there's about 60 people involved from all ranges of opinion, from the most conservative to very radical. And they are working together. There's a, one looking at scripture, one looking at theology and philosophy, one looking at history and patristic theology, and one looking at modern science and the human and uh, the human and biological sciences with really top flight people in each one. And they are now working together across the four streams exchanging views, working together, and they will bring a report mm. in um, towards the end of this year, at the very end of this year. And the point we're doing it so seriously is these are really difficult issues. And they're issues which damage people when we get them wrong. We'll end um, with just a final question. Obviously, it's a huge burden of responsibility, I'm sure, when you were sworn in, uh, ordained as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, do, do you think this will hold, will the Church of England hold together? Uh, no one wants to be the one under whose <laughs> watch it sort of well, fragments, but it, it or, depends. Or, or is it inevitable that there will be some Oh, I don't that? know. I, I genuinely don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do know is, if you go to John 17, uh, and a huge passage of scripture, God is one, the church should be one to represent the oneness of God. We're not meant to be disunited. Uh, for that reason, for whichever way you like to take it, 
the Reformation was a tragedy because it fractured the Church of Christ, as was the Great Schism in the 11th century. Um, but it, um, it's the reality we live in. What Christians have to do is live in the reality of today. We all like to imagine a world in which everything works the way it should. The church is united, everyone agrees with whoever me is, everyone agrees with me, whether it's the archbishop or someone else. Um, and and uh, we all understand everything in exactly the same way. It, it, it's fantasy. So the reality is we are called, particularly by Jesus, to be one. It's not prioritizing unity over truth. That's a nonsense thing. That you can't put the two in conflict. It's rubbish. It's saying we're called to be one, and there are only three significant problems with disunity, which is worth remembering. The first one is it ruins our prayer. These are scriptural, this is what the Bible tells us. Disunity ruins our prayer life. Disunity destroys our assurance of salvation in Christ. And disunity profoundly hinders our mission. Apart from those things, there isn't a problem <laughs> with disunity. So my job is to pray for the unity of the church, to seek to help people to find a way to disagree well within one body and to focus on the two things we're called to do, worship God in Jesus Christ and proclaim the gospel in deed and word. Which brings us very nicely back to thy kingdom come, which in a sense is that very unity that is prayer that very thing. movement. And yes. People want to find out more about thy kingdom come. I think uh, thykingdomcome.global is the yes, place to so go. Yes, I understand. And it's for everyone. All churches can get involved in this. Any they? church, any person, can get involved. There's wonderful resources. You can use them or not use them as you choose. I'm not going to tell you how to pray. You pray in the way you're used to. Just get on with it. Pray for five. Pray for five. Pray every day. Many times if you can. Pray every day. And let's see what God by his spirit in the grace of Jesus Christ will do. Well, you've filled me with some hope. So thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Very much.